You're listening to Every Last Drop Podcast. Join me, Danny, Nick, and sometimes Luke as we explore the relationship between philosophy and art. If you enjoy today's show and want to contribute to what we're doing, visit everylastdroppodcast.com slash contribute. We greatly appreciate your support. Enjoy the show. more of a licorice taste actually yeah it's my favorite beer in the world (laughs) just kidding i'm drinking throat coat helps me sound better especially when i'm kind of congested yeah i'm a little bit congested me too Yeah. yeah i just i've been sick like the last week i'm just coming out of it right now actually mine's been kind of ongoing for the past month like Oh, that's One day no good. I'll be sneezing. The next, I'll be feeling better. And next day, pooping. Yeah. Well, that's not really sick, but <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> What's hey up, guys? Welcome back to the show. This episode is super duper cool. The guest is just off the charts, awesome and and brilliant. Yeah, he is. This I yeah, you were just saying cool. before we started here that this is like a young Hans Zimmer. Yeah, I'm telling you, he's like a, a young Hans Zimmer. Someday he's gonna be. Just it's an interesting comparison, and, and and he looks up to Hans Zimmer yeah. among other people, which you'll hear about. Uh, he's got two projects, okay, Lights in Motion, and we're gonna we're gonna advertise this as, well, I guess we'll say the the guy's name is Christopher Franzen, and he is from Sweden, 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 yeah, <laughs> and uh, his English is actually very good, excellent. He's got a little excellent. bit of an accent, but his I've English is loved the Swedish accent. I yeah, guess. yeah. No, his his English is excellent. Honestly, it's it's. Yeah. I mean, it's just oh, just about as good as any American. Yeah. So he writes music under his own personal name. That's more on the side of what I would call, uh, film score or uh, film soundtrack kind of oriented. That's orchestral sounding and whatnot. Yeah. And then Lights in Motion is a project that's very much in the vein of what I would say, post rock and ambient. Both sides of what he does have ambience in them for sure, but the lights in motion has more guitars and it, it's just a little bit heavier. Yeah. So, and and we talk about both of them really. So, yeah, we don't want to bore you too much and not going to delay you too long because this interview is awesome and it's pretty long and we want you to stick around for the whole thing and we don't want this episode to be like three hours. So, uh, Although I will say just one thing before we get into this interview, uh, if you like the show, we would totally love a nice review on iTunes. That would really yeah. be uh, super beneficial, and uh, we'd appreciate it. We total, to- yeah, yeah. Can I even talk? Can I talk? You got this. You got this. <laughs> we totally appreciate it. Uh, yeah, and visit the website too, everylastdroppodcast.com, dot com, and uh, let us know what you think. Get in touch with us. You know, we like interaction. Yeah. So without further ado. Here is our interview with Christopher Franzen, the musical genius and composer from Sweden. Hope Here you guys go. enjoy it. Yep. You, they will. They will. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Who's listening to this show right now? I bet there's a good chance you aren't following us on social media. Let's fix that. Look up Every Last Drop Podcast on Facebook and like our page. Find us on Twitter at ELD Podcast. And find us on Instagram under the same name, at ELD Podcast. So won't you do me a kindness and follow us? Do it now. Hey, guys. Hey, Chris. What's up, Chris? I'm all right. How are you? Good, good. good. Nice Is to it... see you guys. Yeah, yeah. What's going on today? I'm riding all day. I've been here for nine hours already, so I'm pretty... Wow. I'm pretty beat. I'm going to go for another couple of hours. <laughs> You got to strike once the iron is hot, right? Yes. That's right. Exactly. Feeling That's it. right. I mean, how many days a week do you write usually? I try to write uh, at least six days a week. Sometimes I need a day to uh, just do nothing that has to do with music at all, but right. I, try to keep, I try to keep it fresh. Yeah, some, sometimes like, you got to just decompress, right? And just Yeah, I'm way too bad at that, though. Like, I go for way too long without taking a break, and then I sort of feel all anxious and... Mm. Yeah, I don't really have a break. Uh, yeah, I, I I just worked way too much. I realize that. But <laughs> Workaholic. Uh, yeah, for sure. 
for sure. <laughs> for good or bad. You know, you get things done, but right. um, sometimes the, um, the balance isn't quite there in mm -hmm. your sure. other areas of your life. It's just, yeah, become sort of a loner here. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to say I'm like Gollum here. I just hunch over the piano and write all day. Mm -hmm. I don't really see a lot of people, but music is fun, so I'm, I'm not complaining, really. No, no, and the, yeah. the, the results are worth it in the end, I, I think. It justifies yeah, thank it. you. Yeah, yeah, I think you need to put in the hours. Like, there's no shortcut to actually doing the work. No, <laughs> you know, you're actually, <laughs> you're right, because we were just having this conversation the other day about how, you know, like, we always like to talk about, okay, so I'll, I'll sit down and I'll I'll work on something or I'll write something or I'll try to come up with a song and and it and it really is just talk if you don't like actually get sit down and and do it. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it's just so easy to just to just talk about it and then before you know it like I remember earlier like it's almost the new year now and I remember last Jan like I guess earlier this year in January thinking you know this year I want to the goal is like I want to have at least a five or six song EP of mm -hmm. just some original things that I did. And it didn't yep. happen. It didn't yeah. happen. Yeah. And not going to let it happen again this next year, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's very easy to get caught in that trap, though, of saying tomorrow all the time. And I've just gotten into the habit of saying today instead. Yeah, so that's good. I, I don't think put that's good advice. Off. It's really simple, but it's, it's hard to stay consistent with it. But, it is, yeah. But everyone knows, really, what you need to do. It's just very easy to come up with excuses and find obstacles and stuff mm -hmm. um but i i have a system where if i i don't start something i won't finish when it comes to songwriting or mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. mixing or whatever yeah. so when i have a song uh that i'm working on that occupies my entire life pretty much like i can't relax until that song is done mm -hmm. and i don't start a second song until the first thing is done because otherwise you'll sit there with ten half done ideas exactly. and no oh. proper song. Exactly. Uh, yes, that's it's so. And it true. gets cluttered. Yeah, it gets cluttered so fast if you don't like uh, rein yourself in and actually finish what you start. Yeah, so that, I've got yeah, so many it. partially started things on Me my too. hard drive. I'm so guilty of this. Me too, like, man. <laughs> I really well, we all are. We all are. <laughs> but you got to do what you can, and I can. Like it's it's almost. Uh, like a weight on me when I'm working on something. Like yeah. I, I, can, I can't relax until it's done. Last night I was here for uh, probably 10 hours uh, during the day. I went home and then at around, um, yeah, right before midnight, I actually went back just to finish what I had been working on during the day because I couldn't yeah. go to sleep knowing that I had something I wanted to get down. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's pretty standard in my everyday life, unfortunately. <laughs> a blessing and a curse of maybe yeah yeah oh yeah because <laughs> you got a real but, fire for it yeah. a fire and or compulsive behavior i'm not <laughs> quite sure depending on how you see it Let's no, look it's at it from, I the, think, from the good side though yeah. <laughs> exactly i think it's really fun and the thing is that i i still think it's as fun as i did the first day i went into a recording studio so that's great that's, yeah, yeah the then you know you find enthusiasm. something that's awesome, exactly man. Yeah. yeah, very good. And I noticed, I noticed um, a couple of years back when uh, it's, it was a slight shift when music became a uh, a must more than a passion. You know, you felt the need to produce things constantly, and yeah, that's also a dangerous uh, trap to get into when you don't feel like you want to do it, but you need to do it, mm -hmm. and that can sort of stifle your creativity. But now I'm in a great place. I'm working. All the time, I'm feeling very creative, and when when it feels like that, you just got to go. Mm -hmm. Take so, advantage of it. Absolutely. Anyway, absolutely. Now, what are you guys doing? Are you are you both musicians and guitarists, or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm. Uh, I guess let's see. So for me, I I've been a musician for roughly about ten years or so. I'm I'm 23. Mm -hmm. I'm not that old. And Nick, you are 24? Yeah, I'm almost 25, Chris. I'll be turning uh, 25 on the 19th of this month. I've been playing guitar for about, on and off for about 14 years, I think. Right um, on. So I started actually on, on the bass, and, and that just came from, 
uh, I have an older brother. He's my only sibling, and he's 26. Or, I think he might be 27 now. He just turned 27 in October. But uh, he started playing the guitar, and mm-hmm. it was really just as simple as, well, you chose that. I Like, I wanted to follow in his footsteps in a way because I looked up to him, yeah. but I didn't want to be viewed as a copycat either. So I just picked the bass. So right. that way I'd be playing music too, but not the same thing as him. And so I, I yeah, I, <laughs> so I, yeah, I played the bass for probably about seven years and six or seven years until I, and I had picked up guitar just a little bit here and there until I decided one day, like, yeah, I, I want to write my own things and that's going to require a command of guitar. Um, yeah. so I picked up the guitar and just started teaching myself and I've been playing guitar for about four years now. Still not the world's greatest guitarist by any stretch of the imagination, but I just got an acoustic recently, and uh, that's going to be a very v- valuable writing tool. And my yeah. family also just inherited uh, like this old Wurlitzer upright piano from uh, a oh, family nice. member that just passed away, so that's also nice to have sure. around, so I'm kind of tinkering with that. So there's no more excuses, basically. No, well, <laughs> uh, I think bass gets a bad rip sometimes. I love bass. Me too. Bass is like one of my favorite things to record when I'm writing a song. It's very important as well. It is so important, and it can really like change the entire feel of a track. Mm-hmm. It is a foundation, truly. So I'm always looking forward to playing bass. Although I didn't start to play bass until in my early 20s, because I was a guitarist at first. So we went guitar. I started playing bass because mm-hmm. uh, every guitarist can sort of figure out how to play bass. And then we yep. had a yeah, piano here in the studio, and I just started um, without knowing how to take a chord on the piano. I just started uh, to try to identify the notes, and mm-hmm. uh, but by you had ear. an ear for it, right? Yeah, it was all ear, mm-hmm. like trying to hear. Yeah, and that, uh, that's so at important. first I didn't even know. I just yeah, I just tinkered until I felt that it sounded right, mm-hmm. and then more and more you learn the theory behind it. But um, I think it's very important to to allow yourself to experiment and not like think that it's going to be an easy ride to learn an instrument because mm. as we all know it's not very easy it's a tough it road gets, it, yeah it gets easier but the first hump when you, you know your fingers are aching and you can't seem to get a grip on things yeah. that's when a lot of people just call it quits yeah and yeah. It, it does get easier after a while that's where you need to push through though and yeah and continue on anyway even though you might feel discouraged because it's not clicking yet mm-hmm I started very late. I, I didn't get my first guitar until I was 15. And then I sort of made up for it by practicing like six hours a day, I think. Wow. I practiced till my fingers bled. I'm Ooh. sure you guys have the same thing. when you Before your skin gets hardened, yeah, you get, all, while, like, you get blisters and stuff. Yeah. The worst, yeah. So I would just play like a madman. And I'd, I'd try to squeeze in like four, four missing years of guitar into one. So I get... I sort of got the hang of it pretty quickly, and I re- just, I just loved guitar, and I still love guitar music a lot, even though I now write a lot on piano and and yeah. stuff. But guitar is still my main friend, so to speak. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, I love how we've just kind of already jumped into conversation because we haven't even yes. touched <laughs> any questions that I had written. But so you're so you're out in Sweden, right? That's right. Sweden, okay. So, but you're not you're not in Stockholm, right? No, I'm in Gothenburg. It's the second biggest city here. Gothenburg. And that almost yeah, sounds Stockholm. like Gotham, like, yeah. like Batman. <laughs> it feels like it now. It's so dark. Like <laughs> three in the afternoon, it's completely black outside in the winter time. Yeah, and it's so cold. But Stockholm is probably five six hours away. So this is the the lesser known sibling of Stockholm. Nice. I would say. I do yeah. have a friend that is currently living in Norway. She's like a photographer and, and she's a creative type as well. Now I'm curious, do you do you guys in Sweden feel like you have a rivalry with, with the Norse people? Yeah, we have a we have a famous rivalry. <laughs> the Swedes always make fun of the Norwegian people. And I guess they do too with us. I'm not quite sure. But I my um grandmother is Norwegian, so I'm part Norwegian actually. Oh, that's funny. Okay. Yeah. So but you, I haven't been there for years. So you kinda you have a a foot on on both sides, so to speak. Yeah, I guess so. But I'm more not, so like, with the with the Swedes because yeah, for that's, sure. that's where you're born and raised, right? Born and raised. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. 
Norway, right Nor- Norway, is, Norway is very pretty, though. They have these big um, mountains and rivers and stuff. And the fjords. The Excuse fjords. Me. Yeah, the yeah. fjords. <laughs> Gorgeous nature. I've seen some pictures from it, and I would love to visit. Now, Sweden has natural beauty too, though, right? Yeah, but okay. more, I guess, more flat or more. It's, it's not as spectacular, but it's all right here. If yeah. you go way up north, you can see northern lights and stuff. Oh, and I was oh. just gonna ask about that. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I've seen it, I've seen it once in my life when I was um, twelve. We went on this um, this hike uh, and spent the night out in the wild, and we had to build our and. Uh, yeah, we had to like sleep in the snow. We just wow. had to build a little, whatever, a blanket of snow, and we stay there. And it was so cold that the northern lights came out around midnight, and it was beautiful. Yeah, just, yeah, just gorgeous. That's great, man. Wow, that's really cool. So, so we're gonna try to cover, kind of, I guess. We'll we'll take it from the beginning, kind of how you got started and how that progressed for you. And then we will try to, if we have the time, the time allows, uh, get current and talk about some of the current projects and what's, you know, I know you've got an upcoming release this mm-hmm. next month, which I'm excited about and, you yeah, know, what too. you're up to these days. So just mm-hmm. from the very beginning, let's just talk about how you got started in music at all in the first place. Like what was, what was the beginning? Like when were you interested and in, when did you start picking it up and, and so what was that that start for you? So I got my first guitar when I was 15, and that was because my neighbor had a guitar, and I would start tinkering on it without knowing how to play at all. But I sort of quickly got the hang of it, and then uh, when I got my first guitar, I got absolutely obsessed with playing. And you spend a couple of years just learning other people's songs, uh, and then you get bored with that and try to start writing your own material or find your own playing style or just evolve in a direction and then i met up with a few uh, friends from uh, uh, high school i guess and we started playing together Mm -hmm. and um, that sort of went pretty well and we got to do a couple of cool shows we um, we had we got the chance to uh, play for a big event where the you you remember the twilight films Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. so so uh, the second film had a big premiere here in Sweden when uh, the cast was coming over so we got to play uh, the opening yeah we had to open the entire night for uh, it was probably 10,000 people there uh, but fast forward a couple of years that didn't go anywhere we started drifting uh, uh, into different directions pretty much That's cool. and then I yeah so I always wanted to be able to myself go from creating an idea to having a finished product I didn't like to depend on other people um, in order for me to write music so I tried to learn production and mixing and all that stuff you need to know right to make a song sound like a song yeah and that was um, a couple of years where I spent my uh, nights uh, writing by myself I didn't really sleep that much I had a some insomnia issues. <laughs> mm. So, yeah. I would is just... this when you were still a teenager? No, this is my early 20s. Okay, now we're early 20s. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I jumped a couple of years. Uh, yeah, by myself, I was sort of 22, 23, uh, just writing music, not thinking that I would ever release it or anything, but I just wanted to evolve, and I had a vision of some, some type of uh, music that I wanted to create, but I wasn't at the point where I knew how to get there. Mm-hmm. So just mm-hmm. a lot of experimentation. And I always try to remember that uh, time, spent on do- time spent doing it is never time wasted, no matter if you're unhappy with the results or you know, if you don't feel like you're reaching your, your goals, your potential. That's a good uh, way to look at it. Yeah, because in every, every production you do, you learn what you like, you learn what you maybe don't like. So it all, it, it all takes you a step forward. Uh, so I did that for qu- quite a f- few years, um, and then I, j- I posted a, a song or two on SoundCloud, mm-hmm. uh, and they sort of got listened to a couple of thousand times very quickly, and I got all these comments asking me when I was going to release an album, and there was really no point at all uh, mm-hmm. where I thought that I would actually do that. 
So that took me by surprise, I guess. And then I, I yeah, this was before I started Lice Motion. This was just me mm. uh, putting stuff out. And that encouragement sort of kept me going and made me think that perhaps I should write an album or I should create more music. And mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so all these years, they were pretty much all about me just experimenting by myself at night. And right. that's why I kind of fast forward because there were like three years where I did nothing else but record and try to try to learn stuff hmm. before ever releasing anything. Uh, wow, that's because, that right there. Let's, let's pause on that in just one second because that right there is a, almost a challenge to me. And I think a lot of people in in kind of modern culture, and I think even between Sweden and the U.S., we would have this in common that we live in a world where things are so quick and instant. Yeah. And we want things to be at our fingertips quickly. We would like to have – we live in a world where so many things are on demand now. And yeah. you were saying this earlier, like with with songwriting and music, like it's not something that you can just push a button and you automatically have it. Like it really has to be developed – and I find that very challenging to say, like, wait, what? So I might have to, like, write for th- three years before I ever put anything out. And I know that's not what you're saying. But before I'm, like, at a place where I'm starting to feel like I'm developing an identity musically. Yeah. yeah. Well, it does take a long time. And, and patience is a virtue, they say. Yeah. That's, that's true for, that, that was true for me. Uh, looking back at all those years of just uh, bashing my head to a wall pretty much it was all very it was an important experience having done it uh it's not something i miss really <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, sort of frustra- it's sort of frustrating when you clearly have an image in your head of what you want it to be and you're not quite sure how to get there right but, right yeah so but i think you can learn anything these days with uh like youtube and you can borrow books on the library mm-hmm. you can talk yeah. to people and you know there's all all kind of all kind of ways to uh to get information Mm -hmm. the resources do exist yes yeah for sure so the only thing stopping you really is uh your ambition i would Mm -hmm. say Mm -hmm. yeah how hard you're willing to work right yeah i guess so yeah to have it because uh it's especially if you're making music by yourself like i have been doing for seven years now is a Mm -hmm. sort of it's a lonely existence in a way Mm -hmm. But uh, it's very re- rewarding to be able to create uh, every day almost. So even though it's a solitary uh, existence in one way, it's so great when you get to actually release the music you've been working on and you feel like you have people out there interested in yes. what, you're, yes. what you're producing and you get uh, encouragements and feedbacks. And yes. I, I value that very highly, I, I got to say. That's good. That just, keeps me going. To see that finished yeah. product after working so hard, to listen to your yeah. own song, just the feeling you get. Yeah. That's great. And to know yeah. that other people heard it and connected with it. And liked it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I still feel like that's the that, that's the ultimate payoff when you can release it out into the world. It's no longer yours. It's for everyone really. And yeah. I Wow. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I mean just think about this, you know, we are two guys who are sitting in Indiana close to Chicago here in the United States and you're all the way it's sitting in Sweden writing something you put it out there we heard it we liked it yeah, yeah. it's amazing it is insane yeah that's 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 a great thing about the time we are living in like yeah. the borders and the doesn't really matter where you are in the world obviously not so much no well yeah. no you can always find way find ways to, to talk to people and communicate your ideas and stuff I love that Mm-hmm. not be limited in any way really oh yeah so so, that's- so let's move forward just a little bit past that so you had that period of years when you were you were just writing and writing and you weren't putting anything out until you had a couple things out on soundcloud and you got a little bit of mm-hmm. buzz from that and then what was the next step after that is that when you decided you were going to start lights in motion yeah yeah i i spent quite a lot of time um, thinking about how I wanted to present my vision, so so yeah. to speak, and it was very important for me to have a, in lack of a better word, a concept behind my music, there both visually and. So how'd you come up with that that particular name then? 
that I wanted something that represented what I felt my music was all about. So it all is all a bit abstract, but I hmm. I just oh, I wanted great, something though. that was uh, visually um, powerful, I guess. And then um, I love U2 with a passion. At least I did a couple of years back a lot more. Um, and I was watching all these live shows uh, they were doing. And one show, uh, Bono walked out on stage and there was a big arena with flashing lights and stuff. And before, just before he started singing, he said, uh, light in motion, when he was like looking at all the people. Mm-hmm. And that sort of stuck with me. Hmm. And then when it came time to name uh, my project, I just gravitated towards that. And I added a, yeah, I just felt, I just felt it encapsulated everything that I wanted to get across. It's a great name, man. I yeah. Thank it. you. Yeah. yeah. It feels good. And the visual aspect has always been very important for me. Um, having a clear idea of uh, what, what kind of tone I want, mm-hmm. uh, what kind of colors I use and try to infuse that with the music. So you get that audio visual experience, even if you're just listening to the music out, my go- my goal is for the music to evoke some sort of imagery, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever that may be. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, something. Well, let's. Before I get to that next one, because I immediately I had some things in my head about just the imagery, because I've had some own, I've had my own ways that it's kind of struck me, and some of my own interpretations of of how that comes across, but. Mm-hmm. Before we get there, let's just talk about a little bit of some sources of inspiration. Like, where do you draw your inspiration for for your your writing and the in the music and how it comes out? Yeah, I love movies and TV shows, and I watch a lot of stuff late at night, and that is my main source of inspiration. I gotta say, every mm-hmm. time I watch a, a great movie, I get so inspired, and I almost always want to go here, uh, even if it's in the middle of the night. So that's a big help. Uh, so it's not really uh, music that inspires me. It's more, yeah, again, the visual element of things. Interesting. And what I'll do sometimes is I'll bring my, my laptop here and I'll uh, just put on, it could be trailers, it could be movies, and I just mute the sound and let the visuals run. Hmm. And then I'll uh, uh, like see if I can write to the, the images, so to speak. Yeah, uh, and th- that that usually helps me, um, and I'm also, I like I try to have a very strict work ethic. I can sit here for uh, five hours not getting anything done, um, but then um, eventually you'll you'll always stumble on something. So inspiration is great, but I've tried to train myself in uh, write, write, writing and making inspiration happen, so to speak. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, like, absolutely. Not just sitting around and waiting for yeah. that flash of an idea. Mm-hmm. You got to create an environment where that might happen. Yeah, I always, I seem to always, anytime, <laughs> I, I talk about this book a lot. Uh, there's a book out there by a guy named Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art. Have you heard of it? Uh, yeah, not read it though. Yeah, I've, I haven't funny thing is I haven't finished it. Like I only read about half of it, so I need to go back and read it. But I believe he talks about somebody in there, or maybe this is from somewhere else, but just going off that concept, he just said there, like there's a guy who says, yeah, you know, I always wait for inspiration to hit me before I write. It just so happens that inspiration hits me every morning at 9 a.m. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah, there is truth to that. Um, because, uh, otherwise you can wait forever. So you got to make it happen. Very yeah. True. Very yeah. True. Not very romanticized view, perhaps, but it works for me. Like mm-hmm. I try to try to go here every day at the same time, and I have my guitar, and my piano, and I have a couple of cup of coffee, and just try to try to write. Um, and sometimes you got to go through a couple of hours where it just feels like nothing is happening, but then you'll stumble upon a little melody that mm-hmm. eventually might. Be turned into a song and you you would have never gotten to that place if you hadn't spent the previous hours just trying your hardest yeah right. and i have so many songs that have come to life through that process yeah it's almost scary like <laughs> yeah <laughs> you yeah. don't really control it but yeah that's that's how i view it really that's great 
So, Chris, who, who are some of your, your top influencers or who are some composers or artists you really look up to and, and why? Well, I love film music. Uh, and uh, Alexander Desplat is a French composer who writes some great, great music. I even like uh, more commercial ones like Hans Zimmer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Inception and... Interstellar I mean, soundtrack is just yeah. phenomenal. They are so great. So he's a big inspiration. I'm actually going to see him live with an orchestra in Stockholm in a couple of months. That's wow. That be, Lucky that man. Be, yeah. <laughs> That's jealous. Uh, and I, I love, uh, uh, I still have Coldplay, you know, the, the melodic yeah. things they have going on. And yeah. So I, I listen to a lot of stuff. I don't really listen to a lot of post-rock, though, weirdly enough. Yeah. So it's, it's, more, it's more film music and, uh, yeah, yeah, film music. James Horner is great. Mm-hmm. James Newton Howard. Uh, there's a guy called uh, Keith Keniff. He has a project called Helios. I'm familiar with him. Mm. Yeah, and uh, he is just amazing. So he's he's a constant source of inspiration, for sure. Nice, uh, nice. Yeah, well, the film thing definitely comes out in your stuff. So yeah. now coming back to the visual stuff, because I said I want to get there. Yeah. The, what I've noticed in your visuals, or if, if there's a pattern at all, I, what I see is like, you always seem to put a focus or an emphasis on things like the stars and, and the heavens and, you know, just looking up into the expanse that is the universe. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think that just pairs well so, so much with music that's more ambient and, you know, just soundscapes and things like that. Because it, I always thought when I listened to just ambient music with just lots of reverb i the way i just described it to people who don't really get it is like hey, it just feels like you're kind of floating through space or something you know yeah yeah very much so yeah i think the yeah if, if i if i listen to ambient stuff or very atmospheric stuff it's the lack of um solidness in the music yeah that's sort of like uh, there's not a defined rhythm there mm-hmm. exactly and that is kind of like the the night sky or you know that sort of thing so uh, definitely there is a um, a point to that. I really I, like this. The night sky is inspiring. It is. Absolutely. It really is. And it makes for beautiful imagery too. Oh, for and sure. And I like the color blue, and like bluish tones and that sort of uh, color palette. I really feel drawn to somehow. Hmm. Yeah, you always, it's like anytime you like really do look up into the sky, like intentionally, like you always just get like almost overwhelmed you know what i mean like it's just Mm -hmm. wow that is we are so small (laughs) that we are (laughs) uh but yeah i i i like how you make the connection there with the ambient stuff because i i've i've been there myself as well so now now let's go to like the the first record you ever did with lights in motion so you put out a record called reanimation that was your first debut now was that your first ever album release of anything that you've ever done uh yeah yeah it was that was my first big connected piece of music that i released Mm. Um, and what was the process like for for creating that that was all those years we spoke about earlier Mm -hmm. gathering bits of melody and bits of atmosphere and that was sort of the culmination of i would say five years of work just wow everything pointing towards that moment and um yeah i just that that's a sim like i every album i make sort of represents a certain time in my life i guess that's true for any artist or band but that is very much my insomnia nights capitalized in music like when i listen to those songs i just remember all the nights i was here mm-hmm. and i would go home in the middle of like right before dawn pretty much after having spent like 15 hours here and wow. I think and no one Jeez. has ever done hear these songs. What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Oh, man. Yeah. So, um, the fact that it got a, a pretty good reception was, um, very gratifying for me. Mm-hmm. And that made me instantly want to write a second album. I felt so inspired by the entire, the entire thing. Yeah. It was, it's, it's very rewarding releasing albums. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that almost kind of answers my question, the next one, because I was just wondering, what did it finally feel like when it was finished and it was released and those songs were out in the world? Those 
like your first group of songs that's been available to everybody. Yeah. And and you said, well, it made me want to write right away again for the second yeah. one. Yeah. I felt very inspired. Yeah. And it, it is scary to uh, to release music, as you probably know. Yeah. yeah. Like, you worked on it for so long, and uh, when it's time to share, you always have that little bit of doubt if what you've written is is good enough or if, if anyone will like it. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, like, when I feel inspired, I try to, to make the most of that. Because mm-hmm. you don't really know how it goes. It ebbs and flows, and... So the second album came very naturally. Mm-hmm. Actually, I just never, I didn't really take a break, and just pushed on writing, really. Uh-huh. And uh, the second album is a bit different. I think after every album, you need to reassess and see uh, what you can do differently and which ways to go. So you just don't repeat your same mm-hmm. techniques and the, like you 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 develop certain styles. And especially if you're writing music by yourself, you don't have other bandmates that can come with input and you can't bounce off other people. So I think you need to make a conscious uh, effort to try to step away from what you've just done and find new ways of expressing whatever it is you want to right. express. Yeah. So it doesn't get too stale. Mm-hmm. Exactly. The same thing over so, and over again. Yeah. For me, as much as for anything, or anybody else, this is not fun just doing the same thing. So I always try to um, experiment, see what I can do differently. Yeah. Yeah. Are there ever times when you do uh, collaborate with anybody else or do you pretty much just fly solo all the time? Uh, for my Lives in Motion stuff, I do everything by myself. That is sort of my, my baby, uh, mm-hmm. so to speak. So I'm very protective of, of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, outside of that, I have written music with other people. Uh, there's a guy, an American guy, actually. We've written a couple of songs and I've scored a couple of short films, and that's a very collaborative process, obviously. Mm-hmm. And that's always very fun to step outside your your usual process with other people. So I really enjoy it, um, and I look forward to doing more of it in the future for sure. But when it comes to to lights and motion, my vision is very, uh, I would say, clear, and I have a. Uh, it's it's specific, right? Yeah, it is very specific, and I like I like having total control of everything to the tiniest data detail well that makes sense there's, yeah. there's definitely a reason for that yeah but uh, everything you do that's out of the ordinary is, is good for you i think you evolve and you can bring that back with you when you do your for me my life's emotion stuff uh, every collaboration adds to the process i guess mm-hmm. yeah so well, hopefully you don't mind if we ask you a little bit on the technical side, some mm-hmm. some questions like that. So, what what's your usual starting point when you sit down to write something? Do you do you gravitate towards the guitar first or the piano first? Uh, more and more, it is the piano. Okay. For for my uh, uh, first two albums, there was a lot of guitar, and then. It wasn't really a conscious uh, decision, but I just started to gravitate towards the piano because that was the first uh, thing I saw in my studio. And I would just go there and sit down immediately and not having to bring out all my pedals and amps right. and stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I like to start with a, the with a piano or I like to start with just creating an atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Like I sit, I'll sit here and I'll uh, process things and create like a, a soundscape for... Uh, so I can bring something else into that soundscape, mm-hmm. and that yeah. that always helps me somehow. Uh, so the, and the soundscape of the atmospheres are very um, there. There's no bass in it. There's just a lot of floating. Uh, oh high yeah, frequency. absolutely. Now, do so you, you like to uh, do you like to do that like more with MIDI stuff, virtual instruments, and different synths like uh, I don't know, uh, Omnisphere or something like that, or do you like to use guitar and just use lots of delay and reverb and swells and things like that? A combination of the two. I have Omnisphere. I love Omnisphere, but I have a preset allergy, so I never use anything that's out of the box. Mm. I, what I like to do is, like, I I'll, I'll, I'll layer guitar, and I'll maybe sing a harmony, vocal harmony, and then I'll maybe uh, add a synth layer, and then I'll process it all, export it, bring it back in, uh, mangle it, put filters on it, delays reverb, so it becomes its own thing, so to speak. 
So, so even if you're with... doing separate things, eventually you you merge them all together and yeah, process exactly. them like as one. I never look for like a synth patch to have everything I need. It's like a building block in the uh, bigger picture. So go. I might have an idea of a high frequency sound and I'll look for that and I'll add that and then I'll have something that's a bit more low mid and then I'll bring in a different uh, sound for that and I'll have maybe something that just widens the panoramic soundscape and I might add high guitar, like fiddly, fiddly stuff <laughs> and just mm -hmm. put a lot of delays on it. So I, I like to build my atmospheres uh, consistent of piece by of piece layers. Yeah, piece by piece, exactly. Really and that cool. way you can create a much more detailed and expressive atmospheres. Cause I, I just hate when people put like a, a big pad and just like press a chord. Nothing ever happens. It's just a very static. Mm -hmm. And that's not very inspiring for me. So I like to... Like it's almost boring, right? Yeah. <laughs> I like to create stuff with movement. So it's fluent and changes and it, like it, it ebbs and flows and... Mm -hmm. Right. Like so, yeah. I think in in terms of how wide it's going to be, and also in octaves going both up and low. So it might start very uh, mid, and I'll add top layers and bottom layers in terms of octaves as I go along to like expand mm -hmm. on both horizons. So that's the way I usually set it up. That makes a and lot of I sense because have... I've I've often wondered while listening to your stuff, like, man, how does he get it to sound so big and just how many layers are in there yeah. i've wondered that. <laughs> yeah me too yeah, yeah. there well, are a lot of layers um, yeah. a lot of tracks have almost uh, songs have almost 200 tracks in them oh, in wow. the <laughs> that's incredible yeah now of course <laughs> that that does not mean that 200 tracks are firing at once that just means exactly that's total exactly count. It's like 10 of those tracks can be the tiniest little i call them uh, sonic fairy dust tracks they just <laughs> fairy dust. they just flicker yeah mm -hmm. like in your ear like you're just sprinkling a little bit, just yeah, a, pinch of a it. little bit mm -hmm. here and there, yeah. and have the and and not feel like everything you put in has to be upfront. Like it's worth spending a day just doing these little tiny things that come in and out, because I think it enriches the the listening experience. So totally. I spend a lot of time just sprinkling stuff on it mm -hmm. to make it exciting for me as much as for anyone else. Yeah, cool. those details make the difference, though. I really, I I really think do so. think so. Like you don't you don't create a painting from a couple of big brush strokes. Mm -hmm. Tiny tiny details. So yeah. and I also love that stuff in other people's music when I feel like they have spent a lot of time tweaking it so that it always uh, is fresh and interesting. Yeah. That, yeah, but it is it is very uh, like musically indulgent, but I like it a lot. So I'm not going to stop. Now, this isn't like an artistic question, but I am curious since you're talking about upwards of 200 tracks and stuff. What kind of processing power does your computer have? Like, just how, <laughs> just how powerful is it? Does it need to it's be all, to be, it's, it's to be all right. able to handle? It's, I have a Mac, uh, but what I do is is it a Mac combined. Pro, like one of the tower ones, or are you or are you on an iMac? I am an iMac. Yeah, I need nice. an iMac. Nice, nice. Uh, and you'll what I'll do is I'll push the computer until it sounds like. Like it's breaking down, and then I'll <laughs> I'll fold like ten tracks. I'll make a quick mix of them, and then I'll fold them, bring them back in with like only one stereo track, and I'll do that a lot. Just uh, rinse and wash. Bring it in, uh, uh, process it, bring it back in, export it, process it. Mm. Uh, so, because otherwise the computer would like be on fire right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you got to work around the technology, and it is very good, but. Uh, you can do that. Like you just got to commit to what you've done. Mm -hmm. You can't have everything. Like if you're working with uh, synths or, or MIDI, you can't have 20 instances of Omnisphere running. You got to right. commit to the sounds and just print them. Yeah, just like you would on tape, actually. And then uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's easy by, to forget that by. in a world of digital when mm -hmm. you can you can yeah. you can lay down tracks to the to the nth degree infinitely. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. So you do yeah, push that, that thing to the limits and then eventually yeah, oh, when, yeah. when you reach that, then that's when you have to kind of bring it back down to earth. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, so like now let's say like you have a song finished. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you, I, I imagine you, you do, you wait until 
everything has been written until you start getting into the whole mixing thing, right? No, that oh, no. is where no that that's where I'm sort of different because for me the um, the mixing part is as much a part of the the composition as the the writing. Sort yeah, of. yeah. Can you talk about kind of like production and mixing and just kind of how yeah. all those things link together? Yeah. So uh, usually you'll you'll record um, all the tracks and then you'll mix. Uh, but I like to mix as I go along because uh, I never do any pre-production. Hmm. So I'm actually writing and mixing at the same time because I need to know uh, what's lacking, what I need, what direction I want to go in. And it's not very inspiring to sit and listen to uh, 200 tracks that are unmixed and un and uncompressed. And hmm. So so uh, since I have such a high track count on my productions, I need to uh, keep keep it in order, sort of. So I mix uh, throughout the process, and then once the song is like everything that's supposed to be written is written, I will probably make uh, thirty mixes. Like I'm a, such an anal mixer. Wow! So I'll do I'll, I'll do a mix and I'll bring it um, home. And I'll listen in my iPhone speakers here, and if the like the bass might be just a tad high, and uh, there might be a guitar part that's not coming through and I'll go back and I'll adjust those and it always ends up being like 20 30 mixes just to get it perfectly balanced and then you have to realize that okay now no one nobody's going to be able to hear a difference between mix 29 and mix 30 and that's right. when I'll stop effectively um you do realize that you become like you you do it for yourself cuz people are like if you're not a musician yourself or a, or a producer or a mixer you might not be able to um, pay attention to if the snare drum has a 1 dB increase at 8K. Yeah. You know, mm. It becomes way right. too detailed and nerdy. But Those are things that I do. I <laughs> Not at the same level as you, but uh, I mean, I, I, I do like to mix and stuff too, but I bet I wouldn't even notice it. Probably not, but yeah. you need to feel good about it. And it is important. Like, even, if people, even, even if people can't really point to... A specific instrument or a specific thing you did i think they can sort of feel if the song is very well mixed or if you put in absolutely the, the yeah absolutely the average listener has a what i like to call like a bird's eye view mm -hmm. of the mix because they don't they don't have the language or the understanding to say what it is that they like about it per se but they can use adjectives they can say i yeah. like that that it feels like it's upbeat or i like the energy or I feel like Precisely. the drums are strong, or you know, there's, or I I like the beat. I like how that makes me feel, or I, I like yeah. how the bass yeah. is deep and strong, or you know, whatever. I I don't know. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I always try to get at least one friend who's not into music at all, just to listen to my songs and like judge their reactions, because you need that perspective too, mm -hmm. so you don't forget it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, mixing is mixing is very important, and I think it's very fun too. So, I like to do it. I like to do it myself. Nice. Yeah. You want to take the next one? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We just had a quick question about in, your insomnia, Chris. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, is it something that that has always been? Is it something that you've always always had, or is it you know is related to your mind being too overactive? Is there just things on your mind that keep you awake? Or, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. I, I've always had trouble sleeping, even since I was a kid. Yeah, I didn't really, I didn't really like mm -hmm. to go to bed, and I had trouble sleeping, so I would stay up all night, and uh, yeah. that's that carried on <laughs> into my adult life. Wow. And it goes in waves. Um, I just don't really get tired at night. So last night I sat up until 3 a.m. and then I said I need to sleep because I got to be in the studio by nine the morning after. <laughs> Still couldn't fall asleep. Yeah, but it, uh, I only slept like four hours last night. So that's um, I'm not quite sure. Well, how do like... you feel when you wake up though after four hours of sleep? Do you feel like uh, oh I'm ready to go, or do you feel like oh I'm tired, I need to sleep more? Well, you do feel tired, but like you can always manage for a couple of nights with bad sleep. It's all right, but when you go past like three, four, you're not going to be able to make anything useful of yourself. Yeah, but. So yeah, I, I try to be better at sleeping, or like take that part of the day seriously, because mm -hmm. it's not very healthy not to sleep for a prolonged period of time. 
uh, but I'm not sure why. I never been to a, like a sleep sleep mm-hmm. doctor. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that uh, actually sleep deprivation uh, is is one of the methods of torture that oh, yeah. is used as like forcing people to stay awake and not sleep. So mm-hmm. it's really that important. Is that is the it insomnia is. thing something that's still has it gotten better nowadays from it where better. it was? It's better if I keep like if I keep tabs on it. It's like working out almost. You gotta uh, focus some energy at, at creating good. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, but if I don't pay attention to it, I'll like stay up until six, seven in the morning, and then I'll uh, I won't be able to sleep for a couple of days. So yeah, it is better. It's not like it was when uh, I was in my early twenties. Yeah, just because you don't feel uh, very well if you don't do it. So I nice. pay attention to it. So yeah, it's better. But it are you in your late twenties now or early? I'm twenty eight. I'm twenty eight. Twenty eight. Yeah. So, so that's uh, interesting. What I'm hearing from you is like it's almost like you're saying that sleep is something that you like have to remind yourself to do. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, otherwise I mean, the time will just pass stuff. you by, and before you know it, it's six in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, some people look forward to going to bed, and I like I just do it. I just, yeah, I just do it because <laughs> I need to, and it's like three a.m. and I gotta get up in the morning. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm yeah. not quite sure what that is. Nighttime. Wow. I think it is because I I I have troubles. I have a lot of troubles falling asleep, and yeah. especially if I've been working all day, I like I'll have melodies just repeating endlessly in my head. Uh, and that can be really hard to shut down. So yeah, I, I it's almost like my, you don't want to abandon that, right? Yeah, or the, just the computer. Uh, the computer, my brain. <laughs> <laughs> my brain is over, like so. Like if you mix, you listen to the same melody for hours and hours and hours. Yes. And the brain can't shut it off. So what I'll do is I'll put a YouTube clip on with. Uh, it's called Rain on Tent. So someone just recorded rain inside a tent for a couple of hours. Hmm. And I'll, I'll usually have that sort of suss out the, the noise in my head. and So that'll kind that of helps. like clear out the, uh, that'll like yeah. cleanse your palate, so to speak. Yeah, cleanse yeah. it for sure. I completely so understand, Chris, what you're saying about, you know, just not wanting to go to bed. I feel like nighttime for me as well is probably when I'm most creative. And it's just mm-hmm. like, you feel like you're not missing out on anything outside. You can just, you know, it's all you writing. You kind of yeah. feel like you're the only one there at the time and i totally understand that so yeah that's exactly what when i did my first album i i used to think that the entire city is asleep and i'm the only person awake yeah and it is something magical about that feeling yeah like you get you get extra time that no one else has during that day yeah yeah me and him were joking around actually about uh because i told him a little bit you know i read before we talked to you i was like you know i read somewhere like he did an interview and he talked about insomnia and i was like what if if it's almost like that could be a, that could almost be useful because like mm-hmm. just think about it. it's like you had a, just this this extra amount of hours every day to like get all this stuff done that you don't get done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. For a short while, it, that is true. I think it all comes back to you in the end, though. Like your body, your body needs a certain amount of time to just unwind and relax. So yeah, you can yeah. go. You you can you can go on that for for a while, but then you need to. Um, yeah. It'll come back to bite you if you ignore it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. That's so interesting that you just, like, sleep is like, it's like this biological function that's like a necessity for everybody. And pretty much everybody loves it. And you're like the first guy I've ever talked to that's like, yeah, you know, sleep, I I need to do it. (laughs) So I I do it out of necessity so that I can keep functioning. Like, I I couldn't imagine somebody saying that, like, about food. Yeah, food, you know, it's... Yeah. I need it. Boring. Like I, I just eat it because I need fuel to like keep going. But I don't like love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. When you put it, but when you put it that way, it does sound weird. <laughs> but that's I cool, though. That I mean, that makes you kind of special, I guess. Yeah. So, all right. So, well, uh, okay. So we'll bring things up to speed, like present day, and then I guess we could probably leave it at that. So now, the the upcoming release, because this is we're doing this in December. In January, yep. you've got a new album coming out. Why don't you talk yep. about that a little bit and kind of how you wrote that and if there's a concept behind it. I saw your, there's an, like an album, I don't know what you'd call that, a promo or a trailer video, I guess, yeah, that you trailer, did. Yeah. 
announcement trailer video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. That's on YouTube. It's really cool. I love the visuals. Thank so you. great job Thank with you. that. Um, well, I wrote this album for during the better part of two years. Mm-hmm. So it's been a long time coming. The reason why it took so long was that I, like previously, I've, I've written an album and those songs that I've written that have, be- that have, sorry, that have become the album. And this time I wrote probably closer to 30 tracks that were like fully written and mixed. Um, so I just kept, I just kept trying to, to find uh, the, the right direction because hmm. I felt like three albums behind me, I need to, uh, to create something uh, new. I wanted to experiment hmm. and I just didn't want to like use the same old tricks, mm-hmm. so to speak. And you had a bank so, of 30 songs to go off of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's always hard to kill your darlings um, <laughs> because you spend so much time on them. Yeah. And just to put them aside is mm-hmm. hard. But uh, looking back now is probably pretty good because you always try to um, outdo your previous song. At least that is for me. You love what you, you like. Your your favorite song is the the most recent one. Mm. You try to trump that. And I did a lot of experimentation with. Um, like taking uh, strings and I would make them sound crazy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I would make them sound like weird space synths and I would like uh, track my vocals a lot and I would process them and bring them in. So there are a lot of ambient and atmospheric uh, soundscapes tucked into the songs, uh, which is very fun for me to like... they're not up front, so it's not an ambient album, but the the backdrop is very atmospheric. Oh, I'll be, I'll be listening for it. I'll be listening. Yeah, I spent a lot of time <laughs> just trying to to create cool textures and find a balance in the, in the kind of songs I was writing. Some were very calm and like I used a lot of piano, and some were very epic and big and crescendo inducing. And, mm-hmm. um, I just. Uh, yeah, I wanted to try to write new stuff, and I didn't want to like contain myself to just. I, I didn't want to decide too much. I didn't want to intellectualize my process. I just wanted to to write almost every day and see where that uh, took me. And the the end product is fourteen songs, and um, I can't wait to release them because some of them's been uh, with me for like two, three years now. Wow! Wow! Uh, nice. So yeah, I'll, I'll hope you guys will like them. I I'm sure we will, man. I heard your first one that was out there. Um, I don't remember the name. What was the first one that you? This put explosion. Out? Yeah, uh, there you go. Yeah. Oh no, sorry, silver lining. Perhaps silver, silver, silver lining came first. I think so. Um, yeah. 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 For that song, I, I decided I wouldn't drown it in guitars. I would let the piano take the center stage. And I guess that's been my process in this album that I try, try to find a focus element to bring forward. And then I'll build around it, so to speak, behind it and around it and dress it up in different textures and stuff. But so I have very clear and focused melodies and very hopefully interesting and dynamic uh, backgrounds almost. Awesome. It's always hard to describe your music like this, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, because 
it's so much you did, you did so much that it's almost hard to find the words to to to, yeah. to describe right. it the way the way i'd probably describe your music is it's something that you can listen to and it really just makes you think you know it makes you reflect on your life you, know, you think of dreams memories it's just a really deep it kind it of causes emotional... you to look internally yeah absolutely yeah. thank just, you absolutely that's great to hear I always love when people say that they've traveled somewhere cool. I just did a Reddit AMA uh, the other day, and there was this guy who said he was uh, traveled around all these mountains, climbing them, and he had uh, he played my songs on the journeys, wow. and that the uh, songs became synonymous with those memories for him. And that's I think great. That's so cool. huh. Yeah, that's like I get so happy when I hear that when people actually spend time with stuff I write. Uh, in their everyday life, yeah. it's such an honor, really. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I feel the same way. I mean, I haven't done like crazy mountain hikes, but it, I, I relate to what Nick's saying. Like, it does, it causes me to just kind of like, it. When I listen to, well, there's there's a couple songs you have that, per, that particularly bring more out of that. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, first off. So you so you now you have two different projects right because you got lights in motion and then you are you do release music under your your actual name. Yeah, I do. That's the reason for like I I, I always want to write music and uh, some things are not uh, compatible with the lights in motion project mm-hmm. and then I like to have another outlet so I just keep can keep write in different styles and some is more like uh, film music ish. I yeah, just written a couple I of love tracks it. That are I love like it. Your orchestral, big symphony stuff, and so it's great to be able to to pick and choose and not be limited by. Yeah, your, your music for film and television, volume two. Mm-hmm. I I just adore it. <laughs> Thanks. I love it. It's good. <laughs> and like from from the moment that you were like putting out the teasers for it, uh, the you led off with what is the first track on it uh, called "Light My Fire," and that piano yeah. melody is just awesome it's just terrific that's a very funny story that is probably the first melody i ever wrote when i before i knew how to play the piano my friend had a um, an old grand and it was his dad's and I would sit there and I would just place my, my fingers mm-hmm. and I'd play that melody without knowing what I was doing. And I would, that was the only thing I could play. So every time I'd, I'd go to his house, I would play that thing and he would laugh and say, can't you come up with anything else? <laughs> and then I was writing that album, that album and I just that came to me after years of not having played it at all. And then I turned it into a track and it came very easily. So it was, it was so, so fun to bring something that was like 12 years old and make a song out of it hmm. so it's funny you should mention that song actually. yeah <laughs> <laughs> i like that one a lot just the the pure melody is is great but for me um i think my overall favorite song that you've ever done is a song called paper wings And it's just like that's pretty much just you on piano, and and I know you added some sca- soundscapes in it that kind of come in a little bit later, but yeah. that melody, it, like every time I listen to it, and there's there's been several times when I just put it on before I go to sleep just because of the effect it has on me. Like it, there's there's no other piece of music that I've listened to I don't that I can think of that really just m- makes me think about my life I guess like it just feels like all of my life just kind of unravels and I just start like really just looking at everything and just Mm -hmm. like it it maybe maybe it's overthinking sometimes maybe it's not but it really just feels like it's one of the most emotional pieces of music I've ever heard and it just really like it, it the only way that I can describe it because music is its own language really is like it's it's for those moments when you don't really have like certain words to communicate what's in your heart 
mm-hmm. and and like this does the talking for mm-hmm. you. That's what it feels like to yeah. me. Yeah, it's like Thank I don't know so what to say, much, but man. this 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 is what's going to talk for me right now. Mm-hmm. Wow, I'm honored. Thank you. It's so funny that you mentioned that song because that is so minimalistic and so simple. That's and what's it just great about to show it. That you don't have to stuff your music with a lot of stuff necessarily. Mm. There is beauty in simplicity too. And that that song, I I tracked myself twice, and I did not do any post editing at all. I just wanted to keep it uh, bare and very raw. Mm-hmm. And there is no, I didn't record to a set tempo. I just press record and I played through it, uh, like so it ebbs and flows in tempo. It slows down and speeds up. Mm. And there is something to that that you don't really need to make it perfect in order for it to have an emotional mm-hmm. resonance, necessarily. Yeah. That was my thought process behind how i record that song anyway so yeah well it's almost like sometimes it gets to a point where if if you get too caught up in like trying to make everything like perfectly especially with midi nowadays you start dragging notes to make sure that everything is perfectly on the grid right you start to lose some of the i think like just some of the the natural organic humanness aspect of what makes music so beautiful yeah, you want you want to keep that human element in there if possible. It's very easy to to get caught up in editing everything and making it perfect, but you shouldn't do that. You should just try to keep your fingers from the mouse and just let it be a little un- uneven. And like I think there is some of my most favorite musical moments are when I hear people like they almost make a mistake or they're almost out of tune or whatever, but. It just carries an emotional weight somehow. Hmm. Yes, interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah, and also if you if you if we're gonna back up to the to to uh, like music production, I think that there is a lot of beauty in bringing in um, ugly sounds, mm-hmm. for lack of a better word. Like if every if everything is uh, pristine sounding, it sort of gets uninteresting. Yeah. So I like to I like to bring in weird little distorted noises and combine them with the more lush sounds mm-hmm. and i think that in that contrast there is something interesting more and more i i like gravitate towards that yeah you had a song uh, that uh, i don't remember the name of it so forgive me but you sorry. i remember like you wrote a little blurb about it and you said you sampled a uh a clock ticking i don't i don't know if it was a grandfather clock but like mm-hmm. yeah I think that's a song on my uh, music for film and television yes. called Chase Dreams. sample a clock that's right that's so cool because like that's not even no one would say that a clock is a musical instrument you know but it it made a cool sound yes and it's sort of that sort of became the beat Mm -hmm. you can do stuff like that even if no one else knows you know that there is a weird element in there that sort of puts a Mm -hmm. mark on the song i know yeah yeah like something you just bring in something that that like puts a signature on it because mm-hmm. there's it's some little dissonant element that isn't quite it isn't quite the usual i guess for lack yeah. of a better way of putting it yeah exactly yeah there was there, there's a track on my new album called uh, perfect symmetry where i just to be experimental i i recorded a lot of ap- atmosphere and ambient stuff in a different tempo and then i brought it in and i changed the tempo and then i wrote on top of what I had created and reversed it as well just to force myself to to be like led by this piece of music that I hadn't really any control of wow and it turned out to be uh, one of my most favorite moments on the of the album and that just goes to show how good it is sometimes to not be in, in total control of your process just to force yourself to do something differently like that's a, that's an extreme example, but mm-hmm. it sort of goes with the entire 
bringing in an element of surprise in there. Yes. Uh, which I really like to do. Uh, there are a lot of choirs on this album that are so distorted. You can, you can, like you can tell it's a choir or it's a human voice. And, but it, I know that it's a human voice. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, it's so much more fun than just having a, a synth. For yeah. me, it is. Yeah. Knowing that so many singing in there, but it sounds like really weird, but sort of beautiful too. So there's a lot of small little tidbits and surprises like that sprinkled here and there. Can't wait to hear it. Yeah. yeah. Looking forward. What's So the album's called Dear Avalanche. What's the date? Yeah. The date is January 20th. All right. Hmm. January 20th. Is it five weeks away or six weeks? Something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's close. Like that, yeah. It's close. It is close. Yeah. It should be good. The Still hype the hype is building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to release it. And people are so amazingly kind and encouraging. And uh, so I've really taken that to heart. I feel very supported. And that's something that I won't ever take for granted. You know, you always worry that people won't be interested. And every time I do put up music and I feel like there are people listening, I feel so uh, humbled by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is amazing. Well... Well, that's awesome. And we, we, well, I think I could speak for you when I say this. Like, we, we hope to be part of that group that uh, continues to encourage you to make music. Man, Absolutely. Because, we love thank it, man. You. Thank you. Yeah, man. Because you write some truly beautiful stuff that uh, it just, again, it's, a, it's, it's like stepping into another world where there's another language and, you know, it's, and, yeah, that's what I love Thank about you guys. it. Yeah, it almost feels it's a like, universal language. You know? It is. It is. It's. Uh, it's very. It's very metaphysical, if I can use that term, because yeah. it just feels like it's. It's transcending above just like the everyday physical world of five senses. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's the great thing about music. Yeah, it, it, it truly is a word language. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has been so great. It was really fun to talk to you guys. Yeah, man. Thanks Likewise. so much thanks for for, for giving us some of your time and coming on the show. Yes. And uh, yeah, we'll have this out and. I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks or something, but I'll, I'll keep you posted. And uh, yeah, just thanks a lot for, for giving us your time and talking to us and talking music and creativity and yeah, stuff. Yeah, thank you. Have I a... love it. I love it. Yeah. I get to talk way too rarely with like-minded people, so <laughs> it's been great. Well, hopefully yeah. sometime in the future you can come back. We'll do it again. But uh, for now, yeah, for sure. we'll, we'll leave it at this. So again, right. just to remind everybody, January 20th, 2017, Lights and Motion's got a new album coming out called Dear Avalanche. Go pick up a copy when it's out there. I'm looking forward to it myself. I am as so, well. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, guys. Sweet. All, all right. right. We'll leave it at there. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. All Take right. care. Nice meeting you both. Yeah, and get some sleep, all right? <laughs> all right. I'll Have a good down. day writing, man. Thanks. Take all care. All right. Take care. You too. Bye. All right. Bye. Do you want to keep up with all of the cool stuff that's happening on Every Last Drop? Head on over to everylastdroppodcast.com to find out about everything we do, from a feed of our most current episodes, blog posts, ways you can get in touch with us, and an opportunity to join our email list so you can get up-to-date information about our latest releases. Haven't signed up yet? What are you waiting for? Go! Yeah, what a what a guy. Very enjoyable interview. What a guy that that Christopher guy. That that guy, Chris. He's an inspiration. He is and he has a lot of uh very what I would call quotable qu quotable quotes. <laughs> yeah. Quotes are quotable. <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah, you know, he, he no, seriously though, he just he had a lot of 
very inspirational quotes. He did. Uh, I don't know if I'd call them one liners. I guess one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What? What is there? Was there one that stood out to you in particular? There actually that was. you can remember or recall. Yeah, absolutely. There was one he was talking about. He likes to put a lot of components in his songs, a lot of layers, a lot of little sounds here and there. Yeah, that's for sure. And one of the things he told me, or one of the things he told us was, yeah, that sometimes when you have all these tracks, you're the only one that's aware of what this, what you put in there, this little tiny thing. And the listen, your listeners might not be aware of that, but you can listen to your own song with friends and you have that little feeling like, you know, I, I'm the one that made it and I know that's there. Yeah. And I just think that was really cool. Yeah. I like that. Totally. It's one of my favorite little quotes. Yeah. It reminds me, he said something in there about, uh, you know, after a certain, I think, didn't he say like he goes through like, 20 or so mixes on a song yeah. 20 or 30 i think it was around yeah maybe close to 30 and he says like you know once you're on mix 27 is the listener really going to hear a 1 db increase on the snare drum around mm-hmm. 8k or whatever no no they won't they're not going to notice he's like but you know what you you might yeah like and, you'll know it's there and you and i were kind of talking about this i think the other night on the phone you you were talking about how you were working on one of your 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 songs, and you were like, you know, I don't think there's a huge difference, but I want to I want to get a little better, and then we kind of had that discussion. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, yeah. A, a lot of the things that you do as an artist are to f- like fulfill yourself, yeah. basically. Yeah. It, because again, they may not know that it's there, but the fact that you know it's there, or that you know that there was something that was like really just sticking out like a sore thumb to you, mm-hmm. and was bothering you, and it wouldn't bother anyone else because they wouldn't know it's there, but you went in there and you fixed it. Mm-hmm. And you feel so relieved that you fixed yeah. it, you know? And it it's worth it to do that, even if it's just for your own sake. Yeah. So one of the things for my quote that I think I really liked from him, and this was, I think, kind of towards the beginning, uh, he said, you know, because I, I talked about, like, I wanted to write music in 2016 and it didn't happen. And he's like, yeah, it can be easy to fall into that trap, but or it can be very easy to just say tomorrow, but I've just decided to get in the habit of saying today. Hmm. And I was like, wow. Yeah, that was a good one. That's that was very good. That's so simple. That's that's really all it comes down to. And again, the book I keep mentioning, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, that idea is at the the core of that book mm-hmm. and the core of that philosophy behind you know, Pressfield's saying art is like a war. You 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 choose to keep fighting, hmm. and uh, that choice just means like saying today. No, today. Yeah, today. No, no, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get up tomorrow and do this or do that or whatever. Like, yeah, no, do it today. Tomorrow will always be tomorrow if it's not Ex- today. Exactly. <laughs> like tomorrow can come, and then so you know tomorrow is Tuesday. Let's just say. Yeah. And then you wake up and it's Tuesday and it's like, oh, well, Tuesday has, used to be tomorrow, but it's now today. Mm-hmm. And because you always say tomorrow. It's might not say it again. Yeah. Y- you're going to say it again. <laughs> yep. Exactly. And so. And you can't quite get there. It was a very anti-procrastination quote. And yeah. that's why I uh, liked it so much because I think he was talking to me. <laughs> Don't worry, Chris. All of your, your quotes are copywritten, so no worries about anybody yep. stealing your, uh, your... We'll make sure that that uh, IP gets protected. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, any any usage of the quote, we'll make sure that the money gets back to you, That's man. right. Just <laughs> send us all your bank account information. And... <laughs> yeah. uh, just kidding. All right, we're going to move on to some picks. You, you ready? Mm-hmm. Let's do this. Okay. You want me to go first this time? Uh, I think I got it. You got it? Okay. I kinda, to be honest, I had a few of them that I couldn't decide on. But I actually decided on my pick of the week is Bob Ross. I've always known about Bob Are Ross. Are you serious? I'm serious. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Ross. To me, no, no, no. He's good, but yeah. it's just like he's so, I don't want to say like made fun of. I guess he's made fun yeah. of, but it's just like his character is so it's just rife with opportunities for comedy oh, it, because it, it of, because of his personality sure. and just how he talks and yeah. you know no, I'm just gonna just gonna put a little happy bush in, in, in yeah. there and and you know you don't have to do you don't have to go 
too detailed. Just make it nice and broad. <laughs> you know, he's very much he does like have that. a very calm voice for sure. He does. It makes you think like maybe he was, maybe he had a rough life, and, yeah. and like he used to have, like he used to be a really horrible guy, and like he went through a transformation, and that's why he's like he is now. Yeah, y- you know, it was never know. I just started watching some videos on on YouTube of him. And I just got to thinking, you know, who is this guy? Who is Bob Ross? So I did some research on him, and he was actually in Vietnam, I believe. He was in the war for a while. Oh, okay. That would yeah. explain a lot. So, you know, he saw some pretty serious stuff. Yeah. And I stuff. think that, you know, perhaps that kind of changed him. That kind of made him realize that how life is so delicate, perhaps. And yeah, just his videos are, they're so informative, but he just has this gentleness about him that I think it's, it's just kind of inspiring. And I, I read that he never, on the, he was on uh, Channel 11 PBS uh, yep. for quite a few years, and he uh, he would never accept payment for to be on the show. He would always he would donate stuff, and he would never accept uh, payment to be to be you know for his program to be on there. He was just a huh. giving guy, which I thought was a so he was generous. He was a very generous guy, and uh, I'm sure he got to be popular enough to where maybe income wasn't a problem for yeah. him anymore, and and so he just figured I don't need to worry about being paid anymore. Yeah, maybe maybe not. Maybe yeah. Just just an example of a, a guy who just loves what he loves does. life too. He loves yeah. life. Yeah, he loves the art. Appreciates it. Yeah, and he just does it because he he loves it, not because he's trying to get famous or make a bunch of money so yeah who couldn't learn from a guy like that too mm. just the like you said he's so gentle and yeah great easy teacher. easy going yeah yeah no oh, that's a good pick i'm just honestly yeah. i'm surprised i didn't see that coming at all <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh okay my pick i saw the latest mel gibson movie hacksaw ridge mm. a few weeks back i still need to see that yeah you do it's phenomenal and maybe some of you don't think so but but you're wrong <laughs> i mean it's <laughs> It's a great it's a great movie and even if your critiques are with the movie itself the story that it's about is is an incredible and captivating story and it, and and very inspiring. Mm-hmm. The character it's modeled after of course is um uh, or the the character who's the protagonist who the whole story is about is a guy named Desmond Doss and he was just a private which in the military is like nothing, you know? And he just showed the courage that is just so uncommon, uh, in, uh, in going into war unarmed because he was a conscientious objector and he didn't want to pick up a gun to, to kill people, Mm -hmm. not even the Japanese who were the enemy. He didn't want to kill anybody. And so he ran into battle as a medic to save his comrades who were wounded. And that he did. He saved like, 75 people or so uh, all by himself um, with the help of God, I guess he would say. And uh, Hmm. so it's just all about his story and it's, it's a spectacular story. I mean, it, it's just very moving. And uh, one of my, my biggest compliment of the movie uh, aside from just the fact that it's produced pretty well, like you would expect from any Hollywood movie. Yeah. Um, is the fact that it it really doesn't shy away from the ugliness of war mm. and the brutality and the goriness that's in war. It doesn't back off from that, and it and it and it doesn't like sanitize it and try to smooth it over so that it it's more palatable mm-hmm. as a quote unquote Christian film to you know pitch it to the Christian crowd. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of Christians out there who would like actually be offended by the movie because oh yeah. You know, because there's crude language in it, and there's hey, lots of blood real. and guts, and and but I'm sorry, but that's that's the way it is. I'm sorry, but that's re that's reality. Yeah. They're 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 just trying to tell you the story as as it like it was, you know, like mm-hmm. that's what it was to go into the military, and that's what the guys were like, and that's how they talked, and that's how they treated each other, mm-hmm. and that's what war was like. Uh, I'm sorry, but you know, war is a very ugly thing. It's one of the, it's it 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 it's one of the nastiest black marks you know in all of humanity is when is when people go to war yeah it's Um, a waste it is you know it's it's a shame it ever has to happen Mm -hmm. but it's it's just impossible to avert it eventually it happens you know yeah people are going to fight over something and and this movie is just showing you like hey this this is what war is really like especially the americans fighting the japanese in world war ii it was really ugly and i honestly i think portraying it 
in that realistic light is what allows you to admire his courage even more Mm -hmm. because you see, oh my gosh, like I'm sitting here in the theater and I feel the suspense of them. Like when they're going into battle for the first time, like I feel a pit in my stomach of like, oh my gosh, this would be so scary to go in to fight the Japanese. Mm -hmm. This would be so scary. I'd I'd be quaking in my boots. You know what I mean? And I'm just a guy who's watching the movie, let alone imagine being that soldier who is, you know, Within moments, you could be dead. Mm-hmm. Any like at any moment, and uh, so yeah, that's just my biggest compliment to the film is the fact that it uh, does not shy away from the the brutality and the ugliness of war uh, because that's what allows the light of Desmond Doss and his courage and his virtue to shine in the midst of that darkness. Hmm. So that's why I thought it was a great movie. It was inspiring and uh, loved it. That's yeah, my that's pick. A good pick. Yeah, I yeah. Like it. So Sounds go like check that movie. out. Go check out that movie if you haven't seen it. Yeah. Otherwise, that's uh, all I have yeah. for for the show this week. I mean, I, anything else you want to add um, about the about the interview about about Chris? I mean, go check out his music. Like I think we, I mean, we already said it in the interview. He's got a new record coming out th- this January. Yeah. Uh, I believe the twentieth. It's already. This will be the second time you're hearing this. But uh, yeah, just just make sure you go out and hear it. And uh, get inspired, and and uh, and say today, you know, if you're out there and you're you're working on that on that book, or you're on that album, or like mm-hmm. you're trying to put together whatever creative work it is that that you've got going on, yeah, just you, stop saying tomorrow. You don't you know? have to if you're worried about it not not being good enough, like to your own standards. You don't have to make one piece of art if it's not if it turns out you get it done. It's not how you want it to be. Make make another one. Write done. another song, paint another picture, yep. take another take another picture. Done is better than none. Let's yeah, put, let's put it, it that is. way. And I just came up with that on the spot. But you write Danny Moscow. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> done is better than none. Okay. Yeah. So if you're not happy with it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Like make another one. Finishing, <clears throat> finishing is the stepping stone to getting better. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's really important for you to understand that mm-hmm. you won't get better until you get that thing done and move on to the next. So anyway, yeah. Go out there, fight the good fight, and we'll be back next time. We're going to be bringing you some some more cool people and uh, doing what we do. You guys do what you do, right? Check us out on iTunes if you're listening on SoundCloud. And uh, subscribe. Leave us a nice review. We would really appreciate it. And visit the website, too. Tell us what you think. All right, guys. Take care. We'll talk to you next time. Have a good week. Bye.